Hello everybody and thanks for joining us. Today I'll be talking about enabling observability of serverless workflows with AWS X-Ray. It's basically about how to use AWS X-Ray to identify errors and latency and accelerate troubleshooting within your AWS step function workflows. Quickly, just a bit about me. My name is Ben Smith and I'm a senior developer advocate here at AWS Serverless. I work with builders and developers to help them understand how best to build applications with serverless technologies, as well as being their voice internally to make sure we're building the best services and products and features. Prior to this, I was a web developer and a technical program manager for a number of years and worked at large global enterprises and startups in the world of software and business automation. I've been using and talking about serverless technologies for a number of years, helping developers to understand how best to apply it to their workloads. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about this session or just in general about serverless. My Twitter name is Benjamin underscore L underscore S. So why are we here today? The term observability is a hot term in the industry, much like serverless. And we'll dive into what it means to add the appropriate observability tooling to your workflows, as well as explore the products involved and the best practices. Now, when we talk about workflows, I want to be very specific. We're talking about workloads that are built around AWS step functions. For those of you that are not aware, AWS step functions is a service that lets you coordinate multiple AWS services into serverless workflows so you can build and update apps quickly. You can design and run workflows that stitch together services into feature rich applications. These workflows are made up of a series of steps with the output of one step acting as the input to the next. Building applications in this way as workflows is often easier to understand and reason about and easy to explain to others. Workflows allow you to orchestrate and automate services with error handling logic and parallel workloads, and you can create long running or high throughput workloads. Now step functions is serverless. And these are the tenants that define serverless as an operational model here at AWS. Firstly, there should be no infrastructure to provision or manage. So this means no servers to spin up or operate or patch no physical or virtual container orchestration of any sort. The second tenant is that it should scale automatically. And this is scaling by unit of consumption rather than by unit of server or unit of compute. There should be a pay for value billing model. You could call this not paying for idle because it means you only pay for the execution duration rather than by unit of server. Finally, there is built in availability and fault tolerance. So there's no need to architect for availability because it's built into the service. Really, when we say serverless, it's the removal of server related operations. And that's the important distinction for our customers because it allows them to focus on building an application rather than the management and scaling of the infrastructure to support that application. So back to step functions, you can define your step function workflows in JSON and visualize them from directly inside the AWS Management Console or your IDE as you build out your step function workflow. You can execute, monitor, and inspect your workflows from within the console too. Step functions workflows are essentially a state machine. Each task of the workflow has its own state and it takes an input from the preceding state, it processes that input and it outputs it to the next. And you have some additional configurations such as input path, parameters, result path and output path, which each manipulate the JSON as it moves through each state in your workflow. Step functions currently supports eight different kinds of states today. You have task, choice, parallel, wait, fail and success, and the new map state. And we have more states in the future. Let's look at a few here. State tasks are the things that do your work. These call your application components and microservices. There's two kinds of state tasks today. 
One might push a call to an AWS service and the other dispatches tasks to applications which we call activity workers. Then these activity workers long pole for work. Choice states allow you to introduce branching logic to your state machines. Then there's parallel states that allow you to fork the same input across multiple states and then join the results into a combined output. This is really useful when you want to apply several independent manipulations to your data, such as image processing or data retention. When you combine all these states together, you can build really interesting workflows. We know we're going to hit failures. It's part of building distributed systems. They're complex by their nature. So how do we handle errors in our workflows? Well, for starters, handle them in your workflows. Don't handle them inside your functions. Step functions gives you two powerful tools for handling errors and then solve problems of catching errors and retrying errors as they occur. First, we'll talk about retriers. Now, retriers are valid for task parallel and map states. They allow you to attempt to reprocess the entire state in the event of a failure. They're basically switch or case statements on the error equals values. Two values are shown here on this slide, and they match in order. So if you receive a state stop timeout order, you're not going to retry at all, as defined on this slide. However, for anything else, you'll retry a maximum of two times, waiting initially three seconds and backing off by a factor of 1.5. So that means you'll have your first invocation, which was an error. That's attempt zero. You'll wait three seconds and have your first retry. If it fails again, you'll wait four and a half seconds and have your second retrial. If that fails, you'll move on. At this point, you've waited for a total of seven and a half seconds. The default for backoff rate is two, which gives you an exponential backoff that doubles in seconds as you go. Now again, max attempts of zero is a special value. This means you won't retry anything for a specific type of error. And that's also the default. Captures, by comparison, are when you've decided that you want to handle an error rather than retrying the request. And they're also known as fallback states. Similarly, they're valid for task, parallel and map states. And they're scanned in array order. They're essentially a case or switch statement on those same error types. You get a result path for storing the error. That's stored using the result path key, as you see in the first capture on this slide. If we receive a timeout error, we'll move forward to our recovery state, which does some operation with the value in error info to attempt to recovery. But if we receive any other type of error, we're just going to move on to our end machine state. When we look at the additional capabilities that have been added to step functions in recent years, the first is nested workflows. And this was introduced in August of 2019. Nested workflows allow you to build larger, more complex workflows out of smaller, simpler workloads known as workflow composition. You can create small building blocks of commonly executed tasks and then assemble those across different applications as required. Using this declarative model, you can swap workflow modules without writing custom code. When they were introduced, nested workflows returned a string Recently, we added a second version as shown by the colon two in the example code here. And this returns a JSON object that enables you to parse and drill down to various fields within the return object and make decisions about future states based on the values of those fields. In September of 2019, we introduced dynamic parallelism. And this is commonly known as the map state and it allows you to run multiple identical tasks in parallel. This can come in useful when you have a task that needs to fan out or perform the same identical task over a number of items, or when you need to perform the scatter gather pattern. For example, consider a translation workflow where a paragraph of text needs to be translated into a number of different languages with each result saved to a database. You have one step to load the required destination language, and then for each destination language, you need to perform the translation and persist the results to a database. 
The dynamic parallelism or the map state allows you to perform these identical tasks regardless of the number of destination languages provided and without knowing how many languages will be translated at deployment time. This is also similar to MapReduce if you're familiar with this concept from other languages. Next, we move on to Express Workflows, which were announced at reInvent in December 2019. With the launch of Express Workflows, what were previously known as simply state machines or workflows in step functions became standard workflows. And there's a number of key differences between Express Workflows and standard workflows. Express Workflows are designed for high rates of invocation over short running tasks. You can compare and contrast this with standard workflows which are designed to execute for up to one year per execution. This enables you to do asynchronous tasks, including those that require human intervention, whereas express workflows are better suited for running purely technical processes. Express workflows can start over 100,000 executions per second, much faster than standard workflows, and the state transition rate is nearly unlimited. Express workflows are priced differently from standard workflows too, using a multiple of the gigabytes of memory consumed times the second of execution time that you need your workflow ran for. All of this is aggregated across all of your workflows that are executed for the month, unlike standard workflows whose history we can see in the console. Express workflows only log their execution history to CloudWatch logs. You also must enable logging for Express workflows in order to visualize this. Standard workflows can access their execution history via API calls in the console. Express workflows do not guarantee exactly once execution as standard workflows do. Instead, they guarantee at least once execution. Now, in practice, this means you need to handle issues such as idempotency to ensure that you do not process a transaction or execution multiple times. Finally, Express workflows do not allow you to invoke synchronous or wait for callback invocations on service integrations, commonly known as job run or callback, whereas standard workflows allow those patterns. So service integrations. What are service integrations? These are task states in step functions that allow you to natively integrate with a lot of other services at AWS. Customers asked us for more service integration so they could be even more productive with step functions. Now developers can connect and coordinate 15 different AWS services across different types of compute, database, messaging, and AI, all without writing code. These new service integrations simplify and speed delivery of solutions for workloads such as order processing, report generation, and data analysis pipelines. And service integrations aren't an exotic thing that you've never seen before. They're likely how you're building your workflows today. The difference is that you might be using Lambda functions in your workflows today that are doing something which another service integration can handle natively for you. Here's an example of two workflows that are doing the same thing. One is using only the Lambda service integration and the other is using a combination of service integrations. To manage asynchronous jobs, customers can create a serverless polling loop to detect when a job completes. However, if you use multiple service integrations when your workflow starts an AWS batch job or runs a container on ECS or Fargate or invokes a Lambda function, Step functions will detect for you when that job, container, or function completes its work before transitioning to the next step. This removes the need to create a polling mechanism and reduces the number of states required. It also removes the code and complexity from your Lambda functions. Let's take another example. If we want to build an image to text translation workflow, it needs to first analyze an image, detect text from within the image, translate the source language text into a number of destination languages, store the results in a database and notify the user. This is how that might look when drawn up as a step functions workflow. Now this workflow is using a number of different task states. It's invoked by an event from S3 when a new object is uploaded to an S3 bucket. 
A choice state first branches on whether the S3 action was a delete or a put action. A put action passes the payload onto a parallel state which runs two branches at the same time. One of these branches uses a map state to dynamically apply the translation and database persist steps to the source text. This workflow is using step function service integrations for SNS to notify an administrator when a new image is uploaded. It's using a Lambda function to detect text from the image using Amazon Textract via the AWS SDK. It's using a Lambda function to translate that text, also using the AWS SDK for Amazon Comprehend. Finally, it uses the native integration for DynamoDB to persist that translated text. Now, how can you monitor if this workflow is behaving as expected? How can you detect errors and identify latency issues? This is where you need to enable observability. So what is observability? It's a term that's another hot topic, much like serverless. Observability covers a number of different areas. A common thing that people talk about when you think about observability is that it's more than just monitoring failures. Is your application actually performing as expected? Even if your monitoring dashboard is all green, are your customers getting the user experience you want to give them and that they expect? What's the usage of your application? How many people are signing up? What parts of your application are hitting limits or congestion? Is the usage as expected? What about business relevant information? What's the revenue being generated from what geographic region? And are you seeing the biggest growth? How would an outage of a component affect your business? And what trends can you visualize? What tactical questions do you need to ask? When understanding what observability means in the larger sense, it's how your business and culture think about performance, failures and collecting data. It is certainly worth your time doing some reading and finding resources applicable to your business and how you operate. Now, when it comes to thinking about the tooling and observability, there's basically three pillars that you'll see people commonly talk about. Metrics, logs, and then traces. Now, these are three very separate independent things, as you can see here from the definitions shown below. So today we're actually going to focus on traces, but we'll briefly talk about the tooling that aligns with each of them. Now for us here at AWS, that comes down primarily to two tools. Although I have to be honest that both of these tools are actually much larger than just two individual capabilities. Amazon CloudWatch is one of the oldest services that we have here at AWS. It provides capabilities for logging and metrics and alarms and events and then the ability to build custom dashboards and even more than that. Then there's AWS X-Ray, which is a service that's been around for a number of years now, and it supports concepts such as traces and analytics and service maps, which we'll go into. So let's dive into X-Ray. It's a fairly capable, sophisticated service, or really I say a collection of services inside AWS. The Step Functions integration with X-Ray was launched in September of 2020 and provides an additional workflow monitoring experience that lets developers view maps and timelines of the underlying components that make up a Step Functions workflow. This helps to discover performance issues, detect permission problems and track requests made to and from other AWS services. The Step Functions integration with X-Ray can be analyzed in three constructs, the service map, the trace view, and the trace timeline. The service map view shows information about a Step Functions workflow and all of its downstream services. This enables developers to identify services where errors are occurring, or connections with high latency, or traces for requests that are unsuccessful among the large set of services within their account. The service map aggregates data from specific time intervals from one minute through to six hours and has a 30 day retention. Here you can see the service map for the image to text translation example we looked at earlier. You can compare this to the step functions workflow view. 
Each of the service integrations that make up the workflow can be clearly seen, represented by the relevant service icons. These are the first services to be invoked, the SNS topic put action and the Lambda function invocation to detect text from within the image. Next, you can see the Lambda function that performs the actual text translation from within the map state and also the DynamoDB service integration that persists the results. The trace map view shows in-depth information from a single trace as it moves through each service. Resources are listed in the order in which they are invoked. Here is a single trace view from the same example workflow. On this view, you can see the status of each trace as it moves through each service. You can also see the number of requests made. Notice that the DynamoDB and Translation Lambda function steps are proportionately larger because its view is filtered by traffic. These states are within the map state. They were requested three times, whereas all the other services were requested a single time during the workflow execution. We'll look shortly at how you can use this to identify errors and latency issues and faults. The trace timeline view shows the propagation of a trace through the workflow and is paired with a time scale called a latency distribution histogram. This shows how long it takes for a service to complete its requests. The trace is composed of segments and subsegments. A segment represents the step function's execution. Subsegments each represent a state transition. Here you can see the SNS integration state took 139 milliseconds to complete and started approximately 400 milliseconds into the workflow's lifecycle and was started at the same time as the read text from image lambda function. This is what we would expect since they're both running from within a parallel state. Notice also that the map state transition ran three concurrent executions with each iteration labelled from 0 to 2. Let's take a look at a live example of how you can use these three constructs to help identify workflow errors. So here is my step functions workflow. As you can see, this is the same example that we've been following along with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this workflow running by uploading a number of images to this S3 bucket here. So I'm going to grab my images and uh, here's a selection of images, about 40 in here I believe, or maybe a bit more, and we're just going to drop them straight into here and confirm that and upload. For each image that is uploaded, a new step functions workflow is executed. And if I jump over to the step functions console, you should see that happening in real time. You can see already a number have completed successfully and some are still currently running. If I jump into one that's still running, you can see that it has live updated and completed successfully. I should check as well that my DynamoDB table is actually recording these translations as expected. So I'll just do a quick search for that. I go to my tables, I look for my x-ray example table, and from here I can see there's a lot of items and there's various Spanish, French and uh, German language translations in here for the different text files or image files that I've been uploading. So I know that my workflow is working at least to some degree. I'm going to jump into the x-ray trace view map and then switch over to the service map. Remember, the service map in the X-Ray console helps to identify services where errors are occurring and connections with high latency or traces that were not successful. The service map indicates the health of each node by colouring it based on the ratio of successful calls to errors and faults. A green circle represents a successful call. A red circle represents server faults or 500 series errors. Yellow is for client errors or 400 series errors, and purple is for throttling errors.
So at a glance here, I can see the service icons that represent each step in my workflow. I have a DynamoDB table, two Lambda functions, an SNS topic, and this of course represents my workflow. You can see as well that about 25% of these traces have experienced a fault of some kind. This is over a period of the last five minutes. You can use these options here to change the way your service map is presented. Toggle on the service icons to follow the stream of services, or change the weights of your node to better present traffic or health. You can see that the DynamoDB example and the Translate Lambda uh, service are slightly larger because they're receiving more traffic per execution. They're inside the map state. If I toggle the service nodes, I can see that in the center of each node, the console shows the average response time and the number of traces that it's sent per minute during the chosen time range. You can see the overall workflow takes approximately 2.5 seconds to complete on average. And then each one of the services is also showing the average completion time. You can also see the traces per minute that's being used here. So my workflow is showing data based on six traces per minute. If I refresh that here, you might see that go up. So now you can see that most of my workflow executions have completed and actually it's captured data from 25 traces per minute. And in fact, my error percentage has gone down. You can see that now with a greater number of traces being looked at, it's actually more like something like 10% of these traces are experiencing errors. So the next thing to do is to drill down into some of these errors and see what kind of errors they are and how do we resolve them. Well, the first thing to do is to select the workflow by just simply clicking on the service icon. Now, straight away, this brings up some extra information. Uh, I can see that exactly 15% of the traces have resulted in a fault over this time period. That's based on 25 traces per minute. This is also shown by this response distribution diagram here. This tells me that 4% of my traces completed in approximately 2.8 seconds. And here I'm able to look at the statistical outliers at the top and bottom of my range. For example, I can see that 3% of my traces completed in one second. Now this potentially could be where some of my faults lie. Next, we'll look at how you can accelerate your troubleshooting when using a workflow trace paired with a time scale. I've increased the time period that I'm looking at here to six hours, first of all. I will click on my service icon for my workflow, since that's where my errors are occurring. And again, I can see that I have 25% fault ratio to 74% uh, non-errors. What I'm gonna do is First of all, analyze all of these traces together by clicking on the Analyze Traces button. Now this brings up the AWS X-Ray Analytics Console. This is an interactive tool for interpreting trace data so I can quickly understand how the application and its underlying services are performing. Here I can explore, analyze and visualize traces through interactive response time and time series graphs. I can see that six of my traces completed in around one second. And by highlighting this particular peak, I can look at the various fault causes. I can see here that the main cause of this fault was that no text was found for the translation to take place. And by clicking on this, I can see that 7% of my traces received this error. I can use this same technique to examine, filter and compare other peaks. Another way to visualize this data is by going to the timeline view. So here I'm back on my service map view, which we're all familiar with by now. And I can jump from here to uh, the timeline view by clicking on the view traces button. From here, I can see all the traces over the period of time that I've filtered on, which is currently six hours. From here, I can order the traces by response time or by method or age. I'm going to choose response time, and I'm going to look at the slowest response trace. By selecting the trace, this brings up the timeline view. Now remember, the timeline view shows a hierarchy of segments and subsegments. The first entry in the list is the segment which represents all data recorded by the service for a single request. 
Here I can see this paired with the service diagram or the service map. Again, this is my workflow. I can toggle the service icons here and I can move around this just by dragging the map. Here I'm able to visualize the exact response time for each service or each state in my workflow. And what I can also do is to step through each service. So for example, my Lambda function that reads text from an image, I can click on here and I can see an overview of this particular service in this trace. I can also examine the raw data as it passed through the workflow. Now this particular trace seems to pass through with no problem. I'm going to go back and take a look at some of the others. This time I'll order by age. This one here is the most recent trace in my list. This completed in 4.2 seconds, which is a lot slower than some of the others. So already I know there's a potential problem here. If I hover over this exclamation mark here, I can see that there's a fault being brought up. The cause could not be determined because Lambda did not return an error type. And it also says that the task timed out after three seconds. Now I know straight away that this is due to my three second timeout that I've configured on my Lambda function. My best bet here is that my Lambda function needed more time to examine the image to discover how much text was on it. I can see as well that it took approximately three seconds for my Lambda function to execute. So this correlates with the fact that I set my Lambda function to a three second timeout maximum. Possible ways of solving this would be to have a look at my Lambda function code. Maybe I would want to allocate more memory to my function, increase the timeout, or potentially I may need to refactor my function code in some way, or simply put in place a better failure handling mechanism for this type of error. I could dig right down into the exact cause of this problem and maybe even look at the image that caused it so I know how to prepare my Lambda function for it in the future. I can do that by clicking on the My X-ray State Machine. Here I can take a look at uh, the actual execution uh, resource for this state machine. Then if I jump back into my Step Functions console and search for this step function, I can actually search for that particular execution and we can see how that looks in the Step Functions console. I can step through each state. I always like to do this to really drill down into an error. And of course, I can see straight away that here's the error in my Lambda function. I can look at the exception and that matches very nicely what I saw in X-Ray. So let's take a look at the particular step input for this function. Here is the S3 object that was given to this Lambda function. What I want to do is to have a look at the actual image that was handed to it. Here is the name of that image. Now, I'm curious, so I want to see exactly what that image looked like. If I go to my uh, files, I can see that it's this one here. And if I take a look at this, I'm hoping to find something about it. There you go. There's a lot of very small text, a lot of words there. Probably my Lambda function needs more than three seconds to analyze this particular image. Now I know that I have to either do some more error handling or reconfigure my Lambda function a little bit. Now using a combination of the step functions console and the x-ray console, I was able to pinpoint this error rather quickly. And I can jump straight back into the x-ray console from this trace map here. Okay, so that's some accelerated troubleshooting, error discovery and performance profiling. Now let's have a talk about sampling and data retention. X-Ray applies a sampling algorithm to determine which requests to trace. A sampling rate of 100% is used for those state machines with an execution rate of less than one per second. State machines running at a rate greater than one execution per second will default to a 5% sampling rate. You can configure the sampling rate to determine what percentage of traces to sample. Enable trace sampling with the AWS command line interface or CLI using the create state machine and update state machine APIs with the enable trace sampling attribute shown here. 
X-ray retains tracing data for up to 30 days, with a single trace holding up to seven days of execution data. The current minimum guaranteed trace size is 100 KB, which equates to approximately 80 state transitions. Now the actual number of state transitions supported will depend on the upstream and downstream cause and duration of the workflow. When the trace size limit is reached, the trace cannot be updated with new segments or updates to existing segments, and the traces that have reached the limit are indicated with a banner in the X-ray console. So, to recap, AWS Step Functions now integrates with AWS X-Ray to provide a comprehensive tracing experience for serverless orchestration workflows. Step Functions lets you build resilient serverless orchestration workflows with AWS services such as AWS Lambda, Amazon SNS, Amazon DynamoDB, and many more. And Step Functions provides a history of executions for a given state machine in the AWS Management Console or with Amazon CloudWatch logs. X-Ray is a distributed tracing system that helps developers to analyze and debug their applications. The new Step Functions integration with X-Ray provides this additional workflow monitoring experience. Developers can now view maps and timelines of the underlying components that make up a step functions workflow. This is helping developers to discover performance issues, detect permission problems and track requests made to and from other AWS services. This is achieved broadly using three key X-ray constructs. The service map. This has information about a step functions workflow and all of its downstream services. The trace view map, which gives an in-depth information from a single trace as it moves through each service. And the trace timeline, this is a workflow trace paired with a time scale. This new service integration between Step Functions and X-Ray is enabling developers to reduce problem resolution times by visually identifying errors in resources and viewing error rates across workflow executions. You can profile and improve application performance by identifying outliers while analyzing and debugging high latency and jitter in workflow executions. Now for plenty more information on X-Ray or Step Functions or anything serverless, we have a super aggregation site called Serverless Land. You can get to it at serverlessland.com or by scanning this QR code. And this has loads of other resources, including blogs, videos, workshops, and sp uh, specifically designed learning paths. Everything you need to know about serverless on AWS. Thank you so much for spending the time to listen to this tech talk. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. If you have any more questions about anything discussed in this session, please do reach out to me on Twitter. Once again, my Twitter name is Benjamin underscore L underscore S. Thank you very much.